Isaiah 37 in the Word of God. Last time we saw that King Sennacherib had sent his Rabshakeh, his field commander, his field lieutenant uh, of the Assyrian army to Judah and to King Hezekiah's three-man envoy of ambassadors, Joah, Shebna, and Eliakim. And uh, last week we saw that that Rabshakeh was mocking them and taunting them and blaspheming their God. The Assyrians had taken 46 cities of Judah and they were just a stone's throw away from Jerusalem and they were about to take out the heart of Jerusalem and were about to uh, just take over that city. And uh, they were hoping, the reason they were taunting and mocking and blaspheming uh, is an attempt to intimidate. And what they were hoping that would happen is that King Hezekiah would just surrender. They, they were arrogant. They were overconfident. They fully believed that they could kill everyone in Jerusalem and take the city if they had to. But they also had a war going on with Egypt at the same time. And they really didn't want the inconvenience of having to expend any effort in forcibly taking Jerusalem. They were just hoping they could intimidate Hezekiah into just capitulating and rolling over like a dog so they could just have it for free. They would rather kind of free up the manpower to deal with Egypt uh, and just let Jerusalem uh, be tossed right into their lap rather than actually coming up with a plan and seizing the city. They, they didn't want any... Uh, they wanted it to be easier, uh, as easy as it possibly could be. Uh, and so that's why they're blaspheming and mocking and intimidating. Uh, but we'll see in this passage one of the greatest prayers in all the Bible. Uh, this passage, we'll, we'll cover half of chapter 37 tonight. We'll look at verses 1 through 20. Um, but in this passage is contained Hezekiah's prayer. And if you ask most Bible enthusiasts, Bible, I don't want to say scholars, but Bible students, uh, what maybe the, the number one thing they would associate with King Hezekiah is, is this prayer. It's probably one of the most notable, most significant prayers recorded in all the Bible, not because of its eloquence, not because of its theology, but because of its impact, because of the tremendous results that it prompted, because of uh, just how impactful his prayer was. And so it's something we definitely can learn a lot from because I want my prayers to be impactful. I want my prayers to get to get not just results, to get big time results. And uh, Hezekiah's prayer got big time results because I've got issues that are big time issues. I mean, it, you know, it's if it's if if it's your thing, it's important to you, and it's big for you. It's big, and so uh, we can glean a lot from this. And so let's look at Isaiah thirty-seven, verse one. And it came to pass when King Hezekiah heard it. That is what he heard was all the blaspheming and taunting uh, of the Rabshakeh. Uh, to Eliab, uh, Eliakim, Shebna, and Joah. And so they passed that along to Hezekiah at the end of chapter 36. It came to pass when King Hezekiah heard it that he rent his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. And he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and the elders of the priests covered with sackcloth unto Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. And they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah, this day is a day of trouble and of rebuke and of blasphemy for the children are come to the birth and there is not strength to bring forth. It may be the Lord thy God will hear the words of Rabshakeh, whom the king of Assyria, his master, hath sent to reproach the living God and will reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Wherefore, lift up thy prayer for the remnant that is left. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah. And Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall ye say unto your master, Thus saith the Lord, be not afraid of the words that thou hast heard, wherewith the servants of the king of Assyria has, have blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor, and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. So Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna, for he had heard that he was departed from Lachish. And he heard say concerning Tirhaka, king of Ethiopia, he has come forth to make war with thee. And when he heard it, he sent messengers to Hezekiah, saying, Thus shall ye speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Let not thy God, in whom thou trustest, deceive thee. Well, no problem there. <laughs> uh, saying, Jerusalem shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, thou hast heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all lands by destroying them utterly, and shalt thou be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered them which my fathers have destroyed, as Gozan and Haran and Rezeph? 
and the children of Eden, which were in uh, Telesar? Where is the king of Hamath and the king of Arphad and the king of the city of Sepharvium, Hena and Iva? And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed unto the Lord, saying, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, that dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. Incline thine ear, O Lord, and hear. Open thine eyes, O Lord, and see. And hear all the words of Sennacherib, which hath sent to reproach the living God. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations in their countries, and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they have destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord our God, save us from his hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord, even thou only. That's a great prayer. (laughs) That's a great prayer. Uh, And so our title this evening is Prayer, the Ultimate Turning Point. Prayer, the Ultimate Turning Point. And this was very much a turning point for the nation of Judah and for all the nations of the world. This prayer affected us. Uh, God had promised that his Messiah would come through this people. And this people was on the brink of utter annihilation. The Assyrians could have killed every single person. And then then could the Messiah have come from the people that God said he would come from? Maybe there would have been one hidden somewhere that uh, um, God is able to hide hide one somewhere that they can't get to, of course. But, but this is God doing that. This is God delivering the nation to keep his promises so that the Savior who would fulfill all of the prophecies could be our Savior, could be the, the one that saved my soul, the one that I uh, that ministers to me daily. Uh, and so this was a turning point uh, for them. And, and the nation is in dire straits. It looks hopeless. From a human standpoint, their situation looked utterly and completely hopeless. And there's so much that we can learn from this because as Christians, it is hopelessness that causes so many believers to abandon the things of God and give up on God and quit serving God and quit doing right. There are so many that we're, we're serving and, and are truly were, I did believe, but man, they just ran into a problem. They ran into a predicament that it just seemed like all hope was lost and there was no hope. And they let that hopelessness just dry up their bones. Like we talked about on Sunday, it, they allowed it to cause their spirit to break. And they just wallowed in despair. And they just said to themselves, there's no hope. It looks hopeless. It looks impossible. I'm never going to get the answer I want. I've got a crisis. I've got some major problem. I just can't see how it's ever going to be solved. And they just kind of wallow in despair for the rest of their lives and give up on God and give up on serving just to have kind of a big old pity party. And it all goes back to, to really perceived hopelessness, wrongly perceived hopelessness, because we serve the God of hope. We serve the God of all power. There's always hope when you've got him. There's always hope when he's involved. And so uh, that's what we find here, that as hopeless as it looked, uh, it wasn't. It was not hopeless. And we have times like that in our lives where we need a turning point. We've got a situation, a problem. We've got trouble. We need it to turn. We need the situation to turn. We need a turning point. It's going the wrong way. And it's going to be hard for us. And we're panicking. And we're we're in hardship. And we needed to turn. We needed to change. And, and we're looking for that turning point. And so we can understand what Hezekiah is going through. He's in a crisis. He needs a situation to turn. But there were some things uh, that he had to have before his turning point would come. And so let me just give you a few of those tonight. Number one is a humble desperation. A humble desperation. Our title is Prayer, the Ultimate Turning Point. And here are just a few items that you've got to have before it. And number one is a humble desperation. Uh, Hezekiah was a good king. If you look into 2 Kings chapter 18, the first nine verses or so, the Bible records some very impressive things about King Hezekiah. He was a godly man. And it tells us about his uh, spiritual condition and his walk with the Lord and his desire to honor God and the things that he did uh, for the honor of the Lord. And it's impressive. And he's a good man, but yet he's man. He's a fallible man. And he is prone to his faith and trust waning at times, just like we are. And you can be a good Christian that loves God and serves God and your faith is going to wane. We, we're not steady. <laughs> we, we ought to be steadfast and that's what we strive for. But 
because of our emotions, because of our fallenness, we're just kind of an up and down people. And we want, we want to strive to be, I shall not be moved. I'm anchored. I'm consistent. I'm faithful. But yet our, our, we, we do kind of have good days and bad and up and down and it's discipleship has its ups and downs. And, and that's kind of where Hezekiah is because, uh, even though second Kings talks about how godly he was, Isaiah has spent the last several chapters kind of dressing him down, hasn't he? I mean, we've seen this in the study of Isaiah. He's Hezekiah is messing around with all of these political alliances and all this diplomatic strategy. And he's hoping that's going to, that's going to be his turning point. And Isaiah keeps telling him, will you quit that? <laughs> Don't go to Egypt. Will you quit messing around with the Egyptians? Isaiah just told him a few chapters ago, uh, the Egyptians are men and not God, duh. <laughs> they can't help you. They're not going to help you. Will you knock that off? And Hezekiah hadn't really been listening. But here at the beginning of chapter 36, pardon me, chapter 37, what we just read, when Hezekiah receives this report from Joah, Shebna, and Eliakim, he's no longer interested in Egypt. Finally, he doesn't say a word about Egypt. He doesn't say a word about diplomacy. And he sends his some priests and he sends a couple of these guys that were just mentioned. Um, he sends them to Isaiah. He sends them to the man of God. He, he, now that he's heard what the Rabshakeh has said against God and is demanding terms of surrender and is intimidating and flaunting and mocking, uh, and now that they're just bearing down on him, now he's... He's telling his ambassadors and representatives, he's not sending them to other countries now. He's not sending them to other cabinet officials now. He's not calling for more planning meetings. He's saying, get to the man of God and, and ask him to pray. And that's what happens here in verse, in verse three. Um, well, Hezekiah wept sore, uh, but Hezekiah, oh, pardon me, I was looking at verse 38, chapter 38. Back in chapter 37, thus saith Hezekiah, this is a day of trouble, Go to Isaiah in verse 3, lift, ask Isaiah to lift up thy prayer for the remnant of us that is left. Uh, and so he finally now, it's humbling what happens here. He, he's not talking about Egypt anymore. You don't, you know what he realized? None of my planning has worked. I, I've put all of my eggs into the basket of diplomacy and it's failed spectacularly. We are, we are on the brink of, of complete annihilation. None of my wisdom and none of my... Uh, maneuvering has done us any good whatsoever. I mean, as the king, when you're responsible for the welfare of the people and you're about to be destroyed completely, that's a pretty big slice of humble pie. Hezekiah, you have completely failed to protect your people. They're all going to die. They could die tomorrow. They, there could be a raid in an hour. And they're all, I mean, you can't even touch this army. You, you, you can't. And so all of your strategic maneuvering has failed. You're not wise enough. You're not smart enough. You're not clever enough. And so the Lord is humbling him. All of that politicking was useless. He's humbled. He says, my wisdom has gotten us nowhere. And, and desperation does that. Desperation humbles us. It is so humbling when the Lord shows us that of our own power, we are such failures <laughs> that we, we cannot even live or survive without him coming to our rescue. <laughs> uh, and we go, yeah. I guess I'm not as good at this as I thought I was. <laughs> and that's kind of where Hezekiah is. When you get to the point of complete desperation, you're at the point where you're saying, I've got no other options. All Nothing I've tried has worked. I've got no recourse. Lord, you're, you're my only chance. And really, he's been your only chance all along, but you're now coming to the point where you're realizing that there's nothing left that I can possibly do. I need God to do something. That's the only way I'll live. That's the only way that people will live. We just need God to show up. We just need God to take control. Your Lord, you're my only chance. Um, desperation doesn't guarantee that you will get what you're asking for. You could be desperate and still not get it if that's God's plan. However, there often and usually are times when you will not get what you are asking for unless and until you get desperate. And so desperation can be a good thing. It, it dry, it, we, God drives us to the point of desperation. Uh, desperation has a way of separating needs from wants. You know what? We're not all that desperate about our wants. We've got our requests and things we like, but desperation is usually what identifies needs. When you are desperate, you've got, it's needs that bring you to the point of desperation, not necessarily wants. So Hezekiah sends this envoy to Isaiah 
uh, and they admit that they're at a loss. We've got, we've, we can't do anything. They say we are like, what does it say there in verse two? The children are come to the birth and there is not strength to bring forth. So the, the child, the analogy is that the child is ready to be delivered, but the, the woman uh, is, is sick and weak and ha- does not have strength to deliver this child. And this child doesn't have much of a chance. So we're, we're, that, that's who we are. We can't, we can't bring our own deliverance. We're too weak. And so go to Isaiah and ask him to pray. And so Hezekiah asked Isaiah to pray and say, uh, and look, you need to ask Hezekiah to get a hold of God, deliver us from this evil. We're desperate. Uh, Lord, unless you do something drastic, unless you do something extreme, unless you do something supernatural, um, we need you. We need this to happen soon. Lord, will you reprove this blasphemer, this rab shaker? And to me, the hilarious part of this is that, so so what would you think would happen? A man of God, a, a, a the equivalent of a pastor, this prayer request is brought to him. And so as you read this, you think what I think is going to happen. Now, I've read it many times, so I know what's going to happen. But it's just kind of surprising that Isaiah, the king has sent us to you to ask you to pray for us. What you would expect to happen is that Isaiah would say, all right, let's pray. And that the Bible would record that prayer. Isaiah would say, okay, let's pray right now. Oh, Lord, Hezekiah is concerned. And Lord, will you act here? Hezekiah doesn't pray at all. (laughs) You know why Hezekiah doesn't pray at all? he already prayed. <laughs> okay. Hezekiah had already been in touch, or I mean, pardon me, Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah has already been in touch with God about this. And so when Hezekiah's people ask Isaiah to pray, he doesn't pray. He says, here's what you need to tell uh, your boss. <laughs> he says, I've already got an answer from God. I've already been praying about this. I've already been in touch with God about this. Here's what you need to go tell Hezekiah. That's pretty impressive that he was that, his prayer life was so strong that he was out that far ahead of the issue that would be brought to him. He had already already dealt with it with God. In fact, he'd been dealing with it all along. He, he, he foretold what was going to happen here in chapter 10, in chapter 14, in chapter 33. And Isaiah was just kind of one of those simple guys that just kind of believed that if God said it once, that he meant it the first time. And so he didn't need to pray about it. And, and he, that, that's often sometimes immature believers, oh, will you pray for me that I get an answer on whether or not I should? And it's some some sin or issue that God has already is like, we don't need to pray about that. We already have our answer. Uh, it's there. God already told. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I'm kind of, I kind of look at that and say, I, I'd like to be that way. I, I'd like my prayer life to be so fervent that when some matter is brought to me, I mean, I, I've already talked to God about it and I'm, I'm already ready to give an answer and God's already shown me and, and taught me and I'm, I'm kind of ready to answer right then and there. And, and, Isaiah's got no hesitation whatsoever. He says, here, go to Hezekiah. You tell him this is what's going to happen. <laughs> and that, got a little, that, that would be nice to be that way. Uh, of course, Isaiah was a prophet and we're not. <laughs> and so, of course, the Lord uh, revealed to Isaiah the future and the Lord does reveal the future to us only in so much as what's recorded in his word. So we don't quite have access to all the information that Isaiah had, um, but, but still uh, very close with the Lord he was. And then the Lord tells him, Here's the answer that Isaiah uh, tells them to take back to Hezekiah. Verse six, Isaiah said to them, thus shall ye say unto your master, thus saith the Lord. Here's what God says about this. Be not afraid. Love those first three words. Be not afraid of this man. Be not afraid of this blasphemer, this wicked, disgusting heathen who despises our God. Don't be afraid of him. Uh, The king he serves, the Rabshakeh himself, they are uh, opponents of God and they will get there. You don't have to be afraid. You do not have to be afraid. God says, I've heard him. I've heard their words that they've, these great swelling words that they've spoken against me. God says, I'm on top of it already. I'm a step ahead of you. I've already got a plan. I already know what I'm going to do. I I already am planning on acting. And by the way, here's what I'm going to do. Know that as frightening and scary as this looks and as much mortal danger as you are in, I am God. And I can turn this around in an instant. As much as it looks like it's it's as drastic and dire as it could be, I am God and I can turn anything around and it looks like this man's gonna kill you, but let me tell you this, he's the one that's gonna die. I'll tell you where and when and how he's gonna die because I am able, fear not. Man, what, what an effective prayer that is. When you really take something to God that you need a turning point for, something that's really been weighing you down and burdening you down, and you really get a hold of God, and like Isaiah, you've got an answer and you know what God says, man, does the, the fear is replaced 
by assurance. And the fear melts away. Man, prayerfulness is fearlessness. The most fearless servants of God throughout the ages, the most fearless servants of the Savior that rose from the grave were, were prayer warriors. It is prayer that, that enables martyrdom. It is prayer that, that prompts boldness. That is the effect of strong prayer. Fear melts away. God said, I will cause Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, to die. Look in verse 6. Verse 7, behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. God says, I will cause. I can cause it. I can make it happen. I can send him where I want. I can end his life and take breath from him exactly when I want to, and I can even tell you where and when and how it will happen. It is all in my hand as as. Badly as you need a turning point, I am that able to give it. Man, what a response that this envoy from Hezekiah, I mean, they're worked up and they're digging their own graves and they're wondering how we're going to live and we're on the brink of annihilation. And all right, our boss, Hezekiah, sent us to the prophet and we're so worried that this man, this Rabshakeh and Sennacherib are going to get us. And, and what this prophet of God is telling us is that that very person who's about to, to kill us is going to be killed first. The one who's causing us all this fear, God just told us, thus saith the Lord, he's going to die in his own land. God says, I'm going to send him back home. He's going to die. It's actually going to be his own sons that are going to kill him. And God says, I will cause all of it. Man, you talk about a buzz and electricity that must have gone through that crowd of representatives from Hezekiah. I mean, they're worried about making arrangements for their own funeral, how their nation is going to go on. And this confident man of God who's got a direct line to heaven says he's going to die. They're going, really? oh, are you serious? How, how is that going to, I mean, there must have been an anticipation and an excitement. Uh, something's, they're going to, a rumor is going to be heard and, and, then, and then you just start watching for it. And that's what you do when God tells you what's going to happen. You start watching for it. And, and God proves himself. And it happened, it always happens the way he says it would. Number two, so that is a humble desperation. Number two, a holy indignation. For there to be a turning point, a holy indignation. Sennacherib had been communicating, the two kings, there's Sennacherib, king of Assyria, there's Hezekiah, king of Judah. They had been communicating with each other through their people. You, talk, you call my people and I'll call your people and we'll do lunch. You know, like uh, Sennacherib communicates to Rabshakeh and then Rabshakeh communicates to this Joah, Eliakim, and Shebna, and then they pass along their answer to Hezekiah. So they've been relaying through the game of telephone their messages until at this point, King Sennacherib says, let me send a letter directly to Hezekiah. Verse 14, Hezekiah received the letter. So we know this communication comes via letter. And in that letter, Sennacherib steps the blasphemy up a few notches. You might recall in the previous chapter, the Rabshakeh had told the envoy from Hezekiah, well, don't let Hezekiah deceive you that God can save, that your God can save you. Now it's stepped up even a notch. And Sennacherib says to Hezekiah, don't let your God deceive you. He called Hezekiah's God a liar and a sinner. Your God is, dece there is deceit in your God. There is no deceit in our God. He, he is sinless. And so what a blasphemous charge that is. And that's what really fires up Hezekiah. That's what really gets his dander up even more so than the desperation of his own situation. He begins to see his desperation more as an opportunity for God to vindicate himself than for his own nation to be spared. Hezekiah, obviously Hezekiah didn't want to die. Of course, Hezekiah didn't want the nation to go under on his watch. But more important than that, he could not bear to hear the name of his God mocked and trashed and dishonored. Uh, the greatest prayers recorded in the Bible ask God to work for his own glory and vindication, not just for that of the one praying. For his glory. You know, we're told in James why we don't get prayers answered. Sometimes it's because we don't even ask, we don't pray. Ye have not because ye ask not, or because ye ask amiss that ye might consume it upon your own lusts. And there's times when we don't get what we ask for because our request had nothing to do with the glory of God. It was just what we want. It wasn't for his honor. It wasn't for his glory. It, it was more of just our selfishness. We ask amiss. 
prayer is really, it's such a beautiful paradox that prayer is the true intersection of selfishness and selflessness. Because in some ways we are told, ask for what you want. Prayer is asking and you, you have not because you ask not and delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart and cast your cares and your desires on him and tell him what you want. And you don't get unless you ask, so why not ask? So there is some degree of well, what you want, ask for. He's the one that's got the power to give it. Why not ask? But at the same time, Jesus says, not my will, but thine be done. At the same time, we're asking for things that are according to his own will and not ours. It's really a beautiful paradox. And if you look in verse 20, chapter 37, verse 20, the end of his prayer, now therefore, O Lord our God, save us from his hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord, even thou only. That, sound, that may sound familiar to you as a Bible reader. If you remember back uh, in the great story of David and Goliath, which last time we compared this situation to David and Goliath, it's almost the same thing David said. He said to that big old Goliath, I'm going to take your head and, and I'm going to do it that all the earth might know that there is a God in Israel. And here uh, Hezekiah asked the Lord, save us from this man that all the earth may know that, there is, that, uh, that thou art the Lord. Uh, you might recall the dedication of the temple. When Solomon dedicated the temple, he said, here, and this is a great, that's one of the other great prayers in the Bible, Solomon's prayer uh, to, when they dedicated the temple. Hear thou in heaven and do according to all that the stranger calleth to thee for, that all the people of the earth may know thy name. It's about his name. It's about his glory. And so our, our, that helps us in our prayer life to understand, Lord, I need a turning point. I've got a crisis. I've got a problem Lord, I want you to deliver for me and I'm asking you to deliver for me, but, but do it in such a way that unbelievers who observe my life see that you did it and, and turn all of those who are looking at me to yourself. I want you to help me, but I want you to do it in such a way that people who don't know you are convinced that you are the one that answered and convinced that you are the one that gave what I asked. Yes, I want what I want, but I also really want what you. I want what I want only in so much as you want it. Selfish, selflessness and selfishness kind of wrapped up into one. And then lastly, number three, a personal realization. So we have a humble desperation, a holy indignation. And lastly, number three, a personal realization. Hezekiah, when he first received the report from these three guys about what the Rab Sheikh said, he was troubled. And so he sent them to Isaiah to pray in these first few verses. But it wasn't until Hezekiah received a letter addressed to himself that it got personal. It wasn't until he received that letter that he was struck with the personal nature of a situation. Notice that when those three guys bring him the report, he says, well, this needs to be prayed about. Not I need to pray about it. Someone else. Send him to Isaiah's office. Oh, oh, the Reb Sheikh has got some blasphemy and some, that sounds bad. Go see Isaiah about it. Well, I'm glad he didn't say go see Egypt about it. I'm glad he said go to Isaiah, but, but he didn't say I ought to pray about that. He said, oh, we probably should have someone pray about that. Then he gets a letter directly from Sennacherib to himself. This is to you, big boy. And now all of a sudden Hezekiah is saying, this is about, I need to pray about this. He doesn't kick the can down to, down to Isaiah. Now he prays rather than just the prayer request that's found in the first few verses of the chapter. By the time you get down to verse 14, 13 and 14, uh, Hezekiah is praying himself and not just passing that along. Uh, that's important. You know, uh, you're not going to get a turning point in your situation if you're asking other people to pray about it and you're not. How dare we? You know, a lot of times we get bad news of some kind and our first instinct is to tell it to people and not to God, because we see people and we don't see God. And so uh, our first instinct and our natural inclination is to kind of vent. And we get some bad news and we want to get on the phone or we want to call our friend. Or And our first gut instinct isn't just to go directly to God. And sometimes it kind of flies under the guise of, well, I have a prayer request for you. And really, we just want to vent and we just want to talk. And maybe we do want the person to pray, but how dare we ask them to pray before we've even prayed? What a shame it is when we do that. You know, the, the salvation of our soul cannot possibly ever come from someone else's prayer. And likewise, our salvation from various crises in life is not going to come from someone else's prayer. It's going to come from ours. 
And, and that doesn't minimize the importance, the biblical importance of intercession. It is important that we pray for others and bear their burdens, but there are many times when God says, I am not giving the turning point until you ask for it. This, is, this situation is in your life, and this is my work in your life, and I'm waiting for you to ask me. You're going to line up all your friends, and you haven't even asked me? You got to do it yourself. And that's kind of what Hezekiah is understanding here. And so he spreads it before the Lord. I love that verse 14. Keep getting into chapter 38. Chapter 37, verse 14, and Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it and went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. I love that. Why did he do that? Well, to show God what was in it. God could see what was in the letter without Hezekiah spreading it before him. Uh, if he would have crinkled it up and tossed it in the trash can, God still would have known what was in the letter. But yet there's still something significant about the fact that he put his hands on it and said, Lord, this this letter, the man who wrote this, deliver us from him and reprove him and save us from the person who wrote this. He's getting specific. It's significant that he's doing that. There's something about the physical touching of the object that deepens the sense in which we're giving that problem over to the Lord. Now, I'm not saying it's voila. It's hocus pocus. I'm not saying it's like a, a ritual and you just bring it over to here and do three of these and it's animism and it's a bump, a bump, a bump. I'm not saying that it's the Ernest Angsley and it's the material touching and watch while I knock three times. It, that's not what we're saying. But there is something about the, gra the, the putting your hands on something that kind of has a way of enhancing the sense in which we are casting our cares upon the Lord. And we're, we're specifying. I'll give you a few examples. You ever get a, a financial crisis and a bill arrives and it's from the hospital or whatever and you it's like 20 grand and you're like, well, I have <laughs> a little very small part of that. And, and man, when you go to prayer, it's good to have, Lord, get this, this bill paid. Lord, pay this bill. The, it says 21,300, all that 20, Lord, pay that. Take care of that. You get specific. Maybe you get an injury. Boy, it's, it's a, I mean, I don't think there's anything mystical about it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not getting all charismatic and kind of wacko, but you sprain your ankle. I don't think it's a bad thing to grab your ankle and say, Lord, will you heal this ankle? This one that I'm touching right now, please. Now, we went over to Planned Parenthood to pray. Uh, I'm occasionally over there to have prayer on the grounds there. And one day it was a Saturday and there was nobody, no operations going on. And I put my hand on the building. I said, Lord, clear this place out. Get them out of this building. Get them out of this office. Bring someone else in here. Don't let them replace what goes on here. Drive them out of here, this building right here. Man, I can pray the same prayer from home, but there's just kind of something about specifying. And you know, we dedicate babies. I got to dedicate little AJ. And it's, Lord, bless the raising of this child, this one right here. And the Lord still would know, even if we didn't do that. But it gets away from vague praying. Vague praying tends towards shallowness and lukewarmness. Specific praying tends toward depth and earnestness. It is specific praying that brings about more opportunity to recognize answers. When we're overly general and overly vague in our prayers and we say, Lord, bless them. Well, that is now so subjective that if God answers and blesses them, how are we ever going to recognize it? Well, they seem blessed. I mean, that's a pretty, I mean, they they're, they got two legs still and they're breathing. So I guess that's a blessing. But when you, you nail the Lord down on something, you say, Lord, will you please do exactly this? Now you've just given an opportunity that, that when God answers and, and exactly that is done, you can recognize God answered that prayer. Specificity highlights answers. And then the prayer was in an unmistakable way. And then the prayer was simple. Hezekiah's prayer is four verses. One of the greatest prayers in all the Bible, it's four verses. Would have taken about 40 seconds to pray, maybe a minute. It's not elaborate. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for pretense, he make long prayers. For pretense, he make long prayers. And so what that tells us is that it, it is not the length of time spent in prayer that gets results. If it were, if all that mattered was how long we spent, then we could just kind of get out the old stopwatch and say, well, this one, this answer will require me this many minutes. I'll just sit here like this until I get the answer I want. Ooh, this one is a 47-minuter. All right, I'll get this answer and I'll just, I'll just wait it out. 
No, God is looking, number one, and first and foremost, for quality. He's looking for depth. He's looking for earnestness. He's looking for seriousness. He's looking for desperation. That's what he's looking for. And that's what he saw, saw and heard in Hezekiah. Uh, quality is more important than quantity. However, that doesn't mean quantity isn't important either. Quality is first. But once we've got the quality, we need quantity as well. Uh, and let me give you a few the items of support for that. There are times we were told that Jesus prayed all night long. If quality was important at all, and I mean, pardon me, if quantity was important at all and it was only quality, why would Jesus have spent the whole night in prayer? He, he could have just said four verses and, been, and that been done. He rebuked the disciples. Could you not pray with me one hour? An hour is kind of a long time to pray, especially at night and amongst all that, all that was going on at the time. We're told to pray without ceasing. That's That's quantity for sure. Psalm 55, 17, evening, morning, and at noon will I pray. That's that's quantity. And so there is a place for quantity. And, you know, in all loving relationships, you want to spend significant time. You know, when you love somebody, you don't want to, you, you want to go on a date with your spouse for two minutes. No, you want to spend some time. You want you know, husbands who work and rarely get a chance to be with their kids. They don't want five minutes of a Saturday. They want to spend the day with their kids. They love being with their kids. And when we love our God, we want to spend time with him. Uh, and, and it's not going to be hard to generate that quality. And so whatever you're facing, let me remind you by way of closing tonight that there, there can be a turning point. Whatever your crisis is, you've got God involved. There can be a turning point, but often and usually and probably there will not be a turning point without prayer. Occasionally, God will just give you something you didn't even ask for. But often to really see the, the hand of God move, he's waiting for us to get to the place where Hezekiah was.